right. Hello, everyone out there in YouTube land who is watching this video delayed because it's uh, being recorded for YouTube. And for those people who are on Facebook right now, Facebook Live, 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 Live. I am um, Susan Gerbic, and I am presenting a talk with, uh, well, in conversation with Jean Mercer, who is a person I have known of for many, many years. She is, um, I guess you would consider like an activist in the mental, mental health, I guess, in the community of, uh, of this world that I seem to be a, be a part of. I've never actually met Jean Mercer. We've exchanged emails. I know she's a very good friend and a collaborator with a very good friend of mine, Linda Rosa. And uh, she has a wealth of knowledge. She also has her own Wikipedia page, which has a lot of information on it, which leads you into the rabbit hole of Wikipedia page, uh, rabbit holes. So if you click on one link, then you go to the next link, then you go to the next link, and who knows where you're gonna be at the end. It is fascinating and a lot of detail. So um, Jean is a professor of, She's a professor of psychology at Stockton University in New Jersey, and she is an author uh, and has many, many works. You can see her um, Wikipedia page has a lot of information on it that you can click on, as I said. Also, her website, her uh, there's a lot of information that I'll put in the links on this video if people are interested in checking out um, her more and also all the other therapies and the things we're going to be talking about and it's going to let's let's hope this doesn't get wild and crazy because this is going to be this is a lot a lot of information and Jean and i have discussed we're going to try to keep this as basic basic as we can so that people will be able to understand it from what i understand this is a very frustrating uh uh it's just frustrating because people don't really understand what's happening and um you know it, it verges into areas that can be considered pseudoscience <laughs> it also yeah, i'll let gene explain it because it's kind of confusing but gene why don't you give us a little background of who you are first to start off with okay well what susan was trying to say was i'm a professor emerita of psychology <laughs> which means that I have retired from teaching, but I still have um, a faculty appointment, which means nice things like using the library and the email and that kind of thing. Um, but here I am, free to get underfoot without having to grade papers every weekend. So I've been doing that for, for quite a while now. And um, Susan mentioned Linda Rosa. Linda and I started up on some of these ventures on Thanksgiving Day in the year 2000, as I basted the turkey in between making emails with her. <laughs> and our mutual interest at that time had to do with attachment therapy. This was very soon after the death of a child in that particular kind of pseudoscientific and coercive therapy. So for quite a few years, I was involved in that and um, various associated treatments and uh, began to talk about these as being potentially harmful therapies for children. And there are a number of those um however must have been i don't know seven or eight years ago i had an email from a grandmother in toronto and she was concerned because she thought her grandchildren were being treated with attachment therapy but what it turned out to be i, I mean i never really found out how they were being treated but this was a parental alienation case um and then Things just went from bad to worse. I've gotten more and more involved with this as time has gone on. And right now I'm working on an edited book on the topic and it's, it's awful. So. Yeah, I, I, I understand your frustration. <laughs> I am um, Janice Boynton and others ha and I ha and uh, Linda Rosa have been working on lots of different topics, but we're trying to focus on facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. And that is a world of 
just to know who is who and what's what and the history of this and who's doing this and it's 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 so much to do for one group of people to be able to handle it and it's also extremely frustrating because most people tell us oh i didn't know that was still being done wasn't that discredited like 30 years ago and you're like right. yes it was but it is still being taught and it's frustrating to be able to explain it to people to make make sure people care enough to mm -hmm. want to read about it and and then you know people are still using this in police departments to interrogate people or it's just it's frustrating and and hopefully that maybe this like this talk you and i are having maybe we'll break it down a little bit uh why don't you start with whatever term you think is the most important that people understand in what you're going to be discussing okay well i'm going to start talking about the term parental alienation itself mm -hmm. um now you notice i said i'm going to talk about the term i didn't say i'm going to talk about parental alienation because I'm going to do my best not to reify this particular idea. People use the term parental alienation to describe some events in a particular kind of situation. The basic situation is there's a marital conflict, there's a divorce or just separation, and a child of that couple now decides they do not want to have contact with one of the parents. Mm -hmm. Now, there could be a whole lot of reasons why somebody would make that decision. From the parental alienation advocate's point of view, the reason is often, they don't say always, but often, that one of the parents has brainwashed the child and stop them from liking the other parent. Now, when you say, well, what is parental alienation? This is where it gets so confusing to a person who's never heard about it before and how the rhetoric allows a lot of blurring of meanings in a way that makes things get accepted more readily. So, the term alienation. Now, obviously, this is an old-fashioned term. People used to talk about alienation of affection. Somebody came in and, you know, lured away your fiancé, mm -hmm. and now, you know, it's been alienated. You could even bring a lawsuit against that mm -hmm. person for doing that. Or alienation of property. You know, if you had a stepchild and you were supposed to be the guardian of a trust for them and you frittered away that money, you alienated their property. Mm -hmm. So we have this historical meaning for alienation. Somehow you took away something that belonged to somebody else and you were in the wrong for doing that. But when we start talking about parental alienation, this term gets used to mean two separate things. One is the child's state of mind. Okay, the child is alienated when they say, I don't want to visit mom or I don't want to visit dad. Mm -hmm. The parent, however, has committed parental alienation by manipulating or persuading, or they like to say brainwashing, the child. So as soon as you talk about parental alienation, it's not really clear that there are two separate things that you're talking about. And this makes the discussion really difficult because somebody can appear to be talking about one, and they really mean to be talking about the other. Or when they say one, they are implying that the other one exists. The other problem about it is that partly because of this use of language, it has been assumed by advocates of this belief system that if you see that the child is avoiding one parent, mm -hmm. then you can infer that the other parent has caused that unless there is some dramatic and obvious what they call a good reason okay, so, <laughs> okay. yeah a good reason would be you know domestic violence uh, obvious physical child abuse whatnot um they don't count any of the other things that might make a kid like not really want to go in and see somebody so if you rule out 
and, and by the way, they, they do not carefully rule it out, but in theory, if you ruled out those good reasons, then the only thing that's left that's a possible reason would be mom, usually, alienated the child from dad. Now, is there any observed evidence that this happened? You know, do the neighbors say, oh yeah, she always says terrible things about him. Does grandma say, you know, I've told her over and over again, you can't act like that about your child's father. No, there's none of that. It is simply inferred from the one observable thing. Now, am I getting too complicated? Because I have a little rabbit hole I need to go down to. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should define, let's see if we should back up and define just that real quick. So if a parent says, my ex-wife is brainwashing, I, I love how they use that phrase, just throw it around like it means they've taken the brain and thrown it in a washing machine. Term, but... Yeah, uh, <laughs> that they take the child and they say, I mean, because it is a real thing where a parent will say i don't want you to have anything with your dad because of these reasons and then the child and there could be a th hundreds or a thousand reasons why a child may not want to go with their right. dad it might be they don't they don't like their new stepmother they don't like where the father lives they don't like right. that they have to leave their friends and their school behind mm -hmm. uh, they have a boyfriend and they don't want to have to go live with dad it could be a lot right. of reasons but you're diff you're saying this is different than than a child who just says, I don't want to go with my mom or my dad. And then the, the other parent in court will say, it must be, um, they're alienating me. Okay, isn't there a, like a, isn't there something in there in between that that means that there's, that this parent, parental alienation is actually a disorder? Is that what they say? Or... A medical thing? What they have attempted to say. Okay, so, um, sorry, I was trying to remember what I was going. What You're going to go down a rabbit hole. But yeah, what? and I've forgotten that rabbit <laughs> hole. Let's go down your rabbit hole in, instead. Um, <laughs> I forgot what you said. <laughs> okay, oh, so you're saying, um, is it, is it a disorder? Okay. Advocates of this approach have knocked themselves out to try to get it declared a disorder, to try to get it in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders of the American Psychiatric Association. There's a new uh, edition of that that came out in 2013. They poured the energy into this because the thing is, do you get your, you know, notional disorder into DSM, now you've got a code to charge the insurance company. They haven't got a code to charge the insurance company. So this is only, you know, is going to be have private payment, which reduces the number of people um, who can do it. But the American Psychiatric Association did not accept this. So it is not under DSM a, a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, we have going on another big fight in the World Health Organization with the International Classification of Diseases. This is, and that is, has both psychiatric and physical disorders in it. So there's going to be a new edition of ICD in its, in, progress right now. Mm -hmm. So if you go on the WHO website, you're going to see that people are fighting tooth and nail about this. Now they've given up on the idea that they could have parental alienation as a disorder. What they're trying to do is to get it as an index term. So that would mean that if somebody would look up parental alienation, they'd find it in the index. And this would take them to a page which did not say it was a disorder, but said something like parent-child relationship problem, which is, you know, has got a code for a disorder. So the desire of people who are concerned about parental alienation 
is to prevent it even being used as an index term. Because each of these is a step, you know, toward getting right. this respected. Mm -hmm. So what is it? I mean, I know you can't say what it is, but how is it? Okay, to a lay person like myself, and if I was a parent and I had a child and I was in court and my ex-husband had decided that I was using this against him. Right. Uh, <laughs> where do you go from there? What, how, how, I mean, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Jean. Try to, okay. try to break that down <laughs> for me. <laughs> okay. Can I go back to my rabbit hole sure. for a minute? Go to rabbit I hole. Never in my rabbit okay, hole. Okay, that's fine. Okay. My rabbit hole was this, that when there's a claim that the child is alienated, the child does not have to have refused to visit the person before that claim is made. I've got two Okay. Cases, okay. In, in one of them, the girl was 17. She had been, for, for the previous nine years, she had been living with her mother and father a week on and a week off in the same town. And she just got tired of it. And she said, what I'd re really like is if I can have my room at my mom's house with all my school stuff in it, and I'll go to dad on the weekends. Dad says, no, parental alienation. Her mother has made her do this. What? <laughs> Okay. Yep, and she went through the whole see her brother for three years because she would not recant on on this. Um, and she never said she didn't want to see him. Another one, this was a girl, 15, high-functioning autistic. Mm -hmm. She wanted to see her father. Her father said that he would not let her visit because if he did let her, she might um, accuse him of molesting her. And he also said, that, not that she had ever said that or that there was any thought about that. He also said that when he got custody, he was gonna send her to boarding school. Okay, I'm not saying that these are the typical situations right. because typically the kid did say, I don't wanna go over there. Um, but, what we're really looking at, see, the observable thing is not even that the kid did it. The observable thing is that one of the parents complained that it was not up to what they wanted. That's what okay. is actually observed. <laughs> just, so where are these parents getting this term from? Is it thrown around the courthouses that, yes. you know, you're going to get an extra... It, it's really good if you can prove that your child is being alienated from you or, I mean. Not, not, okay, suppose you can, in quotes, pr prove this. Mm -hmm. Well, there are several benefits for that parent if they can, you know, argue this successfully. One of them is if there have been allegations of child sexual abuse, this is, you know, the, the weight on the other side of the scale. Mm -hmm. She only accused me of that because she's busy alienating the child. So, you know, we'll cross off that accusation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that advantage that, you know, you might get out of certain kinds of complaints that had been made against you. And I don't want to make it sound as though, you know, every time anybody talks about this, that is the case, but sometimes it is. Um, the other thing is, when people bring this complaint in court, they ask for full custody of the child and for a court order prohibiting the other parent from contact with the child. And they ask for the child to be sent to, to a treatment program for the other parent to have to pay for that to the tune of $20,000 for four days. Wow. Wow. So it's, it almost sounds a little bit like it's follow the money in that if a parent has full custody of a child, they, well, you get your tax credit, you get your, you do not have to pay child support anymore. You're able to uh, benefit in any other financial way. Like if the child is receiving uh, social security benefits or whatever, 
sounds like there's a lot of money, financial reasons why a parent might want to, to have this. And is it true that if they have this on the record, will they also get like, you said the parent, the other parent will have to pay for this treatment, but are there other treatments that the child will end up having to go through that will probably be court ordered or uh, paid for by, uh, you know, Medi-Cal or Medicare or something like that? Or is there other? Reasons? No, no. The treatments that are ordered in these cases are entirely of one kind and they're entirely privately paid for. Okay. But and then a lot of money. Yeah. Until the day comes, if it ever comes, um, when they get a diagnostic code for it, it will all be private pay. Okay. And of course, you're not done after the $20,000. No. Because then you have to have aftercare. And then you, the person who has allegedly brainwashed the child, you have to go to a special therapist. And you're not going to be able to see the child until you acknowledge that you did this <laughs> and if you do acknowledge it then of course you can't see the child because you're really a bad person if you did that oh my so, gosh this is horrendous uh, it's kafka-esque absolutely you know once people get involved in this there just is no way out till the child turns 18 and and even then i've seen a couple of cases where the parent who was alleging alienation went to court before the child turned 18 to have the child declared incompetent and under their guardianship. Conservatorship. So it can just go on and on and on. And in my opinion, the real goal here is to destroy the other parent. Because, you know, you get the child, you have full custody of the child, but you're still, you know, laying it on this other parent. It, wow. all, it is almost always the case that the person who alleges parental alienation has got a whole lot more money than the one against whom it's alleged. They already have a lot of money. They don't need the money you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They can afford heavy duty, hired gun lawyers and expert witnesses who will come in and piously say, oh yes, this is the worst case of parental alienation I've ever seen. I can't tell you how many worst cases of it there are out there. They all appear to be the worst case if you listen to what is said in the courtroom. Now, I just wanted to say, want to say, I am not here to say that there could be no such thing as his parental alienation scenario. People are crazy. <laughs> people, you know, there's no limit to the stuff that people can do. And I have no doubt that, you know, this is probably happening somewhere even as we speak. But there's a big difference between the idea that, you know, it could happen, probably has happened, and the idea that you just step into court and you deploy this assault rifle um, and then you get what you wanted. So, the same thing. This is, so Janice Boynton has asked a question and it's right here at this point, it's relevant to when you said that there's treatment for parent, parent, parental alienation, what form would that treatment take? What is uh -huh. that? Okay, now, now the fun begins. Now we get to... Oh, <laughs> okay. Depends on what you think is fun. But here's where we get to the real pseudoscience part. <clears throat> and I want to say, first of all, that in, in talking to lawyers about this situation, I've come to realize that <clears throat> when you go into court, sometimes it's going to get argued that something is not admissible because it's not scientifically supported. And other times it's going to be argued that something is not admissible because most people in the field don't, don't agree with it. But it is almost never argued that something is pseudoscience. So to my mind, there's not just science and pseudoscience. There's non-science. You know, we're talking about value orientations or, or whatever. Um, but that's a form of information. There is science 
And then there is pseudoscience where people claim a scientific support that they don't actually have one, which to my mind is fraudulent. Right. Okay, so when we look at these treatments, I would classify them as pseudoscience. Um, a number of them, um, you know, have publications which say now they've demonstrated how effective they are. None of them are up to the standards we'd have for an evidence-based treatment. None of the studies are up to that standard. Um, so for, for example, one, um, I don't know why I said it like that. Here's one example. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I suddenly I said to myself, I said, why did I say that? <laughs> okay. One, one example. Here is a situation, a publication where the person claims we put the kids in this treatment and look how much better they did at the end. Okay, first of all, the kids who went into the treatment who were kids who had been declared by a judge to be cases of parental alienation. In other words, there was no operational definition or repeatable measure of this. They went through the treatment, which I'll talk about in a minute, and at the end, there were questionnaires handed out to the parent who had wanted this done. Was this a good program? Oh yeah, it was a great program. And then to the kids, and most of them said it was okay. And that is their demonstration that the kid has changed during this time. I mean, we're not even getting into whether they needed to change right, or right. Change, but you know, this is their, their demonstration. So um, to talk about what the treatment consists of, first of all, I want to say that to the best of my knowledge, all of the people who do these treatments, and there are five or six proprietary treatments, um, all of these people say, this is not a psychotherapy. This is psychoeducation. Now, ordinarily the term psychoeducation means, I have a family member who's schizophrenic, and now somebody says to me, let me give you some information about schizophrenia and what you might expect from their treatment and you know what the course of this illness is likely to be like. That's psychoeducation. That's not what we're talking about here. But you see, if you say what you've got is psychoeducation and not psychotherapy, you don't need to have any licensees to do it. Oh. Anybody can do education. Right, I get that. Okay. And anybody does. Agree. No, okay. Okay, so most of them follow, and especially the, the two biggest ones, follow pretty much the same routine. In this routine, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about two parts here. No, three parts. I'm gonna talk about I'm gonna talk about the middle, then I'm gonna go back and talk about the first part. Okay. Okay, or I have a reason here. Okay. The yeah, middle part, <laughs> you, you believe me, do you? Okay, I, I believe you. Okay, okay. The, the middle part is where the kid is actually in the treatment. The treatment place is not at the child's home or in the child's town. Most of the treatment places are actually in California. So if we get a child in St. Louis, you know, where this is being ordered by the court, that child has to go to California and they will go to a hotel or a, a B and B or something like that. There is no regular office space or anything. Um, and they'll go there and the parent that they've been avoiding goes there too, not usually with them, which I'll talk about in a minute. They're there for four days. And while they're there, they watch videos. There's a particular video that's called Welcome Back Pluto. And <laughs> because okay. Pluto does, you know, is Pluto part of the solar, a planet? Oh, I get it, not, yeah, okay. That kind that of thing. Sense. But it's all about how your father or your mother, whoever was the alienated person in quotes, how they need to be welcomed back 
into the solar system that, that you belong to. So there's that. And then there are videos that are about um, how people can persuade you to change your thinking. And that has happened to you. Somebody has brainwashed you and made you think something that's not authentically you and made you think that. So there's video watching, there's game playing, there's um, everybody sitting around talking. But if the child says, well, I don't want to go to her because she slapped me, then the, the moderator, I'm not going to say therapist, says, oh, no, no, no. We don't, we're here, we only talk about the present and the future. We don't talk about the past. You can't talk about that here. Um, then the parent and the child go out to dinner and they go shopping and they, you know, do various things that are thought to be entertaining for teenagers, because most of these are teenagers. Um, and then at the end of that time, they are supposed to go on a vacation together. So that's basically it, till they go back home and then the other parent has got to be seeing a therapist and doing homework. As a homework book, they have to fill this out, they have to give it to the therapist and so on. All the time, they're not allowed to see the child because they were prohibited from any contact with the child beforehand. Okay, so let's go back to part one, because this is really the essential part. Everything I've talked about so far just sounds harmless but goofy, you know. That's expensive, too. Right. Expensive, harmless, and goofy. What? <laughs> you know? Staying in California, I still don't understand why it has to be California, because they're just staying in hotels, watching videos, going to dinner, and amusement that's parks that's and stuff? Or? Where the people are who do this stuff. And they couldn't come out to St. Louis or wherever. They don't. They don't. Now, here's where we get uh -huh. to the crux of things, okay? Exactly. And uh, what I'm about to say, I know in part because of the deposition of one of the moderators in a case I'm involved with, but I know more about it because several young adults who went through this have told me, okay, here's how the kid gets to California. Youth transport service workers take them. Do you know what youth transport service workers? No, I don't know what that is. Okay, well, um, they may be the nicest people in the world, uh, personally, I don't know. I'm not saying anything personal about any of them. But there are companies which specialize in taking kids places where they don't want to go. Well, that sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there, there might be a need for this. I mean, suppose you have a child who's been living with a parent in New Jersey and that parent dies and the kid now has to be taken, you, you know, you're not going to put them on a plane and just send them somewhere. So the other parent may hire people to bring them out. Okay. okay. That, you know, that's I can see that. that. Yeah. Right. But in this case, these people work to take kids to wilderness camps that they don't want to go to, to residential treatment centers they don't want to go to, you know, to a variety of things, and parental alienation treatment is one of them. So you get a, it, it depends on what's going on. The worst case scenario, youth transport service workers tell the parent, you know, the kid's going to be there at their, their house, perhaps, so they've got the kid somehow, and they say, you just, you know, leave the house. The kids asleep in bed. You leave the house, and then we're coming in. And they come in, and they go, it's not always this way, okay? This is just something that can happen. They go in the kids' room, like three or four adults, often dressed all in black and with handcuffs and stuff. They turn on the lights, and they say to the kid, get up. You're coming with us. And these are teenagers. Yes. Yes. And I'm sure there's no trauma at all for these children. Oh, no, 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 not at all. Right. Okay. Now, in other cases, they will take the kids from the courtroom 
okay? I've had, you know, I've been involved with one case where the judge said, you're going right now to this court ordered treatment. And they're taken screaming, you know, by youth transport service workers. Um, or they might pick them up on the sidewalk as they come out of school. The, that they're supposed to go and visit the parent they don't really like. And when they get there, these people pop out and, and grab them. And they tell them, you know, if, if you come quietly, fine. If you won't come quietly, we have handcuffs. Oh my. If you run, and in and, and one deposition I saw, the youth transport service worker was asked, well, what if the girl ran? She said, oh, I would chase her down. But she didn't say, and then I'll tackle her to the ground, but that is what would happen. So these kids are picked up. Oh they can be either, you know, if it's a nearby state, of driven to the place or taken to the airport, put on the plane, and, and they've got the court document there, okay? So the kid says, help, help, to the TSA, and the service worker said, no, we have a court order right here to take her. And they take her. So when you think, oh, this is just a goofy, expensive, you know, way to give a hard time to the other parent, and the kid will go through this and big deal, you know, in, in a way it's no more, <laughs> no worse than if you went to Disneyland when you didn't really feel like going. To oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, okay. no problem. Yeah. I, People in black come into your bedroom, turn on the right. light, say, get right. out. We're going to go. Exactly. If you don't come peacefully, I will use handcuffs. Okay. Same as Disney World. Yeah, I got right. it. <laughs> right, right. Like, it's just kind of a holiday for you. Yeah, so you just have holiday. To it in this context, this is what has happened. So it's not really surprising that these kids start complying. Well, you know? of course, they don't want to go through it again. So they're going to say, yeah, right. we're fine. Everything is great. Right. And they're, you know, and they're told, well, you know, if you don't do what we want from here on out, uh, we won't be able to help you. You'll have to go to residential treatment. You'll have to go to wilderness therapy. And then you won't be able to be in, have any contact with anybody from there, you know. Um, so the, the kids are not stupid. You know, they knuckle under for for this kind of thing um when you read in the publications of these advocates they occasionally will say something about the child being transported but they just look at their little harmless bit that the stupid but harmless bit that they do mm -hmm. and just ignore all this other stuff so that plus the fact that they are not able to demonstrate that they even knew what was going on to begin with because there's no established method even among that group for identifying parental alienation. Um, they haven't shown that there was an actual change in attitude or behavior afterward to just show that the parent who wanted it is pleased with what happened. And then they just forget the whole part about what was what was going on before they even got there. So I have no words. <laughs> this is great. This is okay. You like it? <laughs> wow, this is going on. Okay. Right, this is going on. And in some of these cases also, even if the kid is not yet taken for this treatment the court will find a 17 year old in contempt and tell them that if they don't do you know what they were supposed to do they're going to jail what and it, you know in at least wow one, in at least one case i can think of um there were three kids i think and they did not want to have anything to do with their father and they refused to go out to lunch with him. They were sent to um, the juvenile facility for a week. Now, and an interesting thing I was just reading today in a court document, 
talking about the, you know, finding a particular girl in contempt. And it said, the purpose of the contempt proceeding is to vindicate the authority of the court. Wow. Now this family court is supposed to be making decisions in terms of the best interest of the child, not the best interest of, of the, the court. court. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. Okay. You said it was a middle, a beginning and an end. Okay. At the end. That's right. The end part is where, first of all, they're supposed to go on vacation together and, and make nice. And then afterwards, this child will go home with the parent they wanted to avoid because the prohibition of contact with the other parent is in place for 90 days with no, we're talking no contact. Okay. We're not talking telephone calls, anything else, no contact. And that can be extended. So now they're living with the person that they were desperate to avoid to begin with. And they are also, you know, in some way involved in what do they call them, maintenance therapy or something like that, where a person is constantly telling them that it was because their mother or their father brainwashed them that they thought they didn't like this person. So that's where we, <laughs> we are. And this is why I, the reason I say that we're talking about pseudoscience here is the claims that are made literally that this is admissible under Daubert standards. So how often is this happening? I, I mean, I don't know a lot of people who've been divorced, so I am involved in custody battles, so I don't see this as right. a common occurrence and that I've heard of, but you tell me. Uh, I, wish, I wish I could tell you. Oh. But. <laughs> we don't know. No, I do not know. And of course, these records are usually sealed. You know, you can't just go into a court and I mean, they might have lots of records you could see, but stuff about children, no. You know, that's gonna be sealed. So we only really know about it when somebody is gonna testify about it, you know, and then sees the documents. And, um, or when the kid, now a young adult says, hey, I wanna tell you what happened here. Or when an investigative reporter gets into the situation, which has, has certainly ha happened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know. I'd like to be able to say, but I cannot say. And, and, you know, this is one of the most important things. If these people are claiming that they've got scientific evidence, the first thing they should be saying is incidents and prevalence. And they make estimates of, you know, well, there are this many divorce cases and we are just assuming that this percentage of them, well, I guess I can't, what I can say, and I think this is fairly well documented, that of divorce cases that involve children, only about 10% of them get into these high conflict situations. Um, and of those, presumably, you know, a certain proportion are um, where somebody has enough money to hire the right kind of lawyers and experts, you know, those will go to the parental alienation level. So we're not talking about an awful lot of people, but we're talking about something done, which is not only unnecessary, but potentially harmful. Seriously harmful. Right, right. Seriously and financially harmful. stressful. Right, right. Potentially harmful for the kids, certainly yeah. harmful for the parent who gets is alleged against them. Because if I can just say about the, the thinking here, you know, why would a judge say, oh, you made your child not like their father and therefore you can't, you know, you're going to lose custody of them. We don't take custody away from people who beat the heck out of their children. <laughs> You know, they have to beat them a lot before they... Yeah, your death. <laughs> right. So what's the argument here? Well, the argument is it 
would be emotional abuse to brainwash a child in this way because a child needs to have both parents. And if it's emotional abuse, that's the same difference as physical abuse. And it's the same difference as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Therefore, the person who we are inferring did this is a child abuser. Okay, so then that's the rationale for changing custody. Oh my gosh, Linda, Linda Rosa has just made a statement. She says, it is common in Colorado, judging by the family law lawyers who advertise that they are experts. There are also state support organizations for the alienated, alienated yep, parents. Right, right. I mean, you said this is in California is a hotbed of this happening. Well, it's a hotbed of the people who do the treatment. Now, as for hotbeds of parent groups who support it, um, you know, who make these claims and, and rev each other up about the whole thing, those are every place. But I certainly agree with Linda, there's a lot of that in, in Colorado. Um, but, you know, if I had to name places that people go for this treatment, the two major places in terms of the, as far as I know, the number of, of kids they take in are in California. Um, there's one that's in Washington State and one in New Hampshire. Um, but, all, you know, California is the, the major place and is... What the, city do you know? Uh, well, there is one which is in the LA area. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one which is closer to Sacramento. Wow. So, you know, this is a good point that Linda has raised. It, since we don't know how, how common this is, but it could be done a search or, you know, an investigation into how many lawyers advertise right. that, they can, that they are specialists or experts in this. And that would give us some sort of number of how, um, how prevalent it is. Right. Well, and I've, I've done that. I mean, I've done a, a count. Okay. And I gave up after getting into several hundred on the internet. But whether any of them has actually done a case, I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, okay, they're supposed to be experts. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've done at least one case. <laughs> you well, but, you know, they don't have to have done one case for a lawyer to say he's an expert on it, you know, unless somebody calls him on this, complains to the Bar Association. You know, oh. what's to what's to stop this? It's just so frustrating. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. It is. So what would happen if a person is accused? Let's say somebody's watching this video and they just happened the court today, and the whatever this has happened, this this is the first time they're he hearing this this phrase. They they went to the Wikipedia page to get some basis of what this is. What can a parent do? What is the? Is there any advice you would? you would give them? Well, you got to have a lawyer. You cannot go pro se on this. It's just too, too difficult. And the, the hired guns who come in on the other side, you know, you'll never be able to, to deal with yourself. But when you have a lawyer, you have got to have a lawyer who will step in immediately and, and challenge any evidence about parental alienation which is put in place by the other side. If you don't challenge it right away and it gets accepted into evidence, getting rid of it at that point is extremely difficult if not impossible because you said it was okay and now you, you know you can't say it's not okay mm -hmm. even though now you know it's not okay. Um, so you know, they, if people are in a marital conflict, just such that they think, well, you know, that other person will just do anything to get over. And they have money. Right. Then when you have to talk with your lawyer to begin with and say, do not let that be put in evidence. Because once it's in evidence, then you have to get an expert witness. Um, and the whole thing becomes extremely complicated to fight it at that point because 
they can make it sound very, very good. And they can talk about how somebody is suffering from a delusional psychosis. And, you know, and that person is a, a narcissist, uh, you know, heaven forbid, you know, not that the world's not full of narcissists, but if you get called one in court, you're in, in big trouble. You know, as if that means you could do anything, no matter how bad it was, it, you wouldn't stop. Um, but that's very difficult. I mean, could I say, I'm not a narcissist. How much ice is that going to cut? You know, <laughs> and, admit it. <laughs> right. And, and to prove the absence of something. It's very difficult. If you know? Yeah, you right. can't do that. Right. So the, the thing is to plan ahead on it you know, and make sure that this does not get admitted. And it should not be admitted either, you know, on Daubert or Fry standards, you know, and it would be pretty easy to demonstrate that it did not live up to either of these sets of standards. But somebody's got to do it. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't live up to this. Of course, they're not going to admit it. Now, they're going to admit it, you know, if it's not challenged. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to be going through a case where you, there's custody and you are wary of your ex, um, maybe it does sound like there's a lot of money involved. So obviously it's going to be somebody who your ex that has some money or access to money, like their parents or whatever. Um, then when you're looking for your own attorney, you need to find an attorney who understands this enough to be able to say, if it comes out of the of somebody's mouth in that court, it needs to be shut down immediately. Just right. oh, this is right. done. Right. Um, oh, she's uh, Linda says to explain Daubert and versus five. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I haven't heard that either. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so the Daubert standards ask you to bring in support of your claim um, scientific evidence, which is done. Uh, has been found in a way which makes it falsifiable so that it would be have been possible to say no it didn't work out this way um, and it has to follow standards that uh, a particular scientific discipline would use and you have to be able to say things like how many false positives and false negatives are there in identifying something in, in this way so there's a whole list of things that you have to do uh, specifically, you know, to demonstrate that something that's a, a scientific claim is admissible in court. Um, the Fry standard is that other, most other people in the field agree with it. Um, and I was reading a, a case a couple of weeks ago in which the judge said to these lawyers who were arguing parental alienation, he said, and do most people in the field agree with this? And one of them said, oh, I don't know anybody who doesn't agree with it. And the judge said, oh, okay. okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. So How many people the, do you the know? Lawyer, the lawyer on the other side needed to say, I, you know, to what extent are the people you know representative of the whole field how many articles in peer-reviewed journals are, you know, this whole argument. But so. it's going to take somebody who's educated in this area, necessarily. Yes. I, mean, this, <laughs> I wouldn't know anybody who, I mean, I, this seems to be something that is part of training or something for, for people who are in the, the family, uh, family law. Right. Of, yeah, I... Oh my gosh, is there any hope? Okay, so Jean, since we're getting close to an hour, that time goes fast, huh? It does. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's a lot of fun, but it does go fast. So tell me, what, is there any hope? What do we, I, I think the Wikipedia pages are in really great shape for people who are interested in information on the topic that mm -hmm. will, again, lead you down rabbit holes. You've also written on this, I believe. And um, you've written on a lot of things, but I think you've written a lot on attachment therapy, um, the rebirthing movement. Oh my gosh, that is a whole nightmare of, I remember these cases too, of people being rebirthed and, and dying 
from yeah. being rebirthed, suffocated, they can't breathe. And, and uh, anyway, that's different. Um, so can you recommend some books and maybe some, some things that people could read if they wanted to have it, more information about this? Well, I would, would give say, us some hope. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll try. Please, please. Some hope. Uh, unfortunately, the parental alienation people have gotten in on this, uh, you know, to bring out their books a lot. This is the usual whack-a-mole of alternative therapies, you know. They're in there and they've got a publisher, Charles C. Thomas, you know, who will publish all, all their stuff. Um, and uh, there's a lot of that stuff out there. However, uh, if you go to the website of the American Professional Society on Abuse of Children, APSAC, they have a statement about this stuff on their website. Um, and as you know, I have a couple of journal articles out, which are not going to be easy for people to find. I do have um, a blog on which I've been talking about this a lot. It's called Child Myths at blogspot.com. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got dozens of posts about uh, parental alienation on there. And some of us who are very concerned about it are working on an edited book about this. We have a contract with Routledge, and that should be out, you know, next summer, I suppose. None of this never happens quickly. And um, that's really pretty much the, the best I can do. Um, but, you know, just to keep your eyes open about what you're reading, and that if it's um, an organization that calls itself Parents' Rights, that's probably not going to be <laughs> the right place to go. Um, I, th I think if you look at the Wikipedia page, if I remember correctly, we put on there a reference to um, a uh, television investigation uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, a year or a year and a half ago, there's a, a link to that in which there was um, the investigator. It, it was all about family courts in general, but it boiled down to looking at the parental alienation stuff. Yeah, you uh, said there's been some investigative journalists have been looking into this. Yes, there's one case particularly, which I was. I think I'm pronouncing this correctly. I'll have to spell it for you, but it's in Michigan. Um, the family is called Simhoney, which is T-S-I-M-H-O-N-I. -I. If you just Google the Simhoney case, you know, you're going to get to all kinds of investigative journalism about this, and um, including the, the judge losing her position for the way she handled it. Wow. Can you spell that one more time? Because yeah. I think you said it started with an E. No, no, T. T is oh. in tree. T S I M H O N I. N I. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how I would pronounce that either. <laughs> I can't pronounce anything anyway. I asked somebody who had actually been involved in the case and he had a lot of trouble saying it. Tony, yeah, okay. That's that sounds pretty close. And so hope, is there some hope? Is it there is hope for anything right now? I, I mean, I, I, yeah, there's <laughs> <laughs> all things must come to an end. Aren't we tired of winning yet? <laughs> I'm <No>. tired of winning. <laughs> I can't help thinking how Isaiah Berlin used the term counter enlightenment about his period of time, but it's worse and worse as far as I can see. This extreme polarization. I, you know, where nobody is willing to talk about, you know, what if we did have a case where the kid really avoids somebody, but there's no real problem and we want to help this family. Nobody's talking about that. Mm -hmm. Every Over on the one hand, we're saying it's parental alienation, you know, send her away for treatment. Um, and on the other hand, they're saying it's not, it's probably child sexual abuse, otherwise she doesn't want to go. You know, the middle part, which would probably cover a lot of the cases, if not all of them, gets, it, 
it, it's not that there aren't people who are doing it. Of course, there right. are people who are working with, with this, but it doesn't get the kind of, you know, loud, noisy, enthusiastic yelling and screaming and, you know, exchange of legal, legal blows um, that the polarization does, because that's, that's how people like to think about stuff unfortunately and we seem to be you know as a group getting worse and worse about liking to think about things that way so um some of us are working really hard on this uh but while there's life there's hope shall i say that <laughs> that's that a really sense. discouraging thing to say isn't it <laughs> it makes me not want to ever suggest anybody ever have a child again <laughs> If you're going to do it, just do it by yourself. Have, have, adopt the child. You're the only. <laughs> that, that would certainly be a, a partial solution. But something I'd like to suggest that everybody can do. If you hear people throw around the term parental alienation, say to them, don't say that. That leads to really serious. Stuff. A mess. A mess. Right. For right. Everybody. You know, the, the daughter of a friend of mine was annoyed because her stepson who was 17 didn't want to go to florida with her and her husband and his 10 year old half brother and she immediately started saying it's parental alienation his mother doesn't want him to go with us and i kept saying don't say that don't say that you know when people maybe his mother doesn't want him to i don't know but when people start talking about parental alienation it escalates horribly I mean, you're basically saying that that person is a child abuser. Mm -hmm. And, and that's going to make it really ugly. The consequences of that, imagine that somebody really wanted to push this and you're a school teacher. Now you're a child abuser. You got to be a school teacher. No, you bring your life. Right. Absolutely. Of, you know, using up all your money and so on. So... And you your know, reputation is harmed forever because where there's right. smoke, there's fire. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. Fire, smoke, smoke, fire. Right. That's exactly <laughs> where right. Where there's smoke, there's hope. <laughs> where there's smoke, there's hope. <laughs> All right, Jean. So this has been extremely fascinating. I think we have, you know, maybe we'll have to do a talk on some of these other topics in the future. I hope that there's hope if there is life there, so, <laughs> I, so, so. I would appreciate if you would send me some links that you think no would be relevant for people to look at and I'll put them in the notes of the uh, video that'll be up on YouTube and okay people find it okay I had a really good time this is so did I. So this did I. and I Linda Linda Rose has already suggested a, a place to uh, advocates for children and therapy has a wicked yes. page in Pennsylvania and so that'll be helpful so we'll be able to yes. put that up in the show notes Okay. All well, right. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you everybody who joined us on uh, Facebook Live. Okay. Bye, Linda. Bye, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Okay. I'm going to turn you off here. <laughs>